Welcome, everyone, and happy new academic year. I was just saying to um, Brian and Father Ken, this is such a beautiful pairing of people from across the campus that are coming together for not only this event, but to be in friendship and, and have lunch. So thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to be with us and have this important conversation, because it certainly matters. Um, my name is Karen Kiefer, and um, I welcome you uh, on behalf of the Church in the 21st Century Center. Um, I thought we'd just begin with a prayer. Um, so in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned. It is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So we're so happy um, to introduce to you the fall issue of C21 Resources, um, which is on all of your tables journeying in faith amid polarization. Um, I just have a couple of quick thank yous, and then I'm going to turn um, the program over to my colleague, Lynn Burdelli. Um, first of all, I just want to offer my profound thanks to Professor Brian Robinette, who is the master curator of this issue. Um, and then also to Father Ken Himes, who offered uh, his inspiration in us actually moving forward with this idea and this issue. Um, and also a special thank you to um, a friend of the C21 Centers, but also uh, Professor Brian Robinette's doctoral student, Megan, um, Megan Hopkins, who couldn't be with us today, but um, we're, we're holding her in love and in prayers. And um, her, her wisdom uh, really was amazing and kind of helping us choreograph this magazine. So special thanks go out to Megan. And of course, um, the opportunity to thank my colleague, uh, our associate director here at the C21 Center, Lynn Berardelli, um, who lived in the details of this magazine. I, I, I don't think there's a typo in there, but if there is, don't tell Lynn. Um, but she did a masterful job, so I, I want to offer her special thanks and hand it over to you, Lynn, so we can get rolling here. Thanks. Great. Thank you, everyone. Welcome. Um, before I introduce our speakers today, I did also want to echo Karen's sentiments that it was absolutely wonderful to work with both Brian Robinette and Megan Hopkins, so thank you very much. And then I also wanted to recognize the editorial board that works with us and reviews the collection prior to its publishing, um, namely Melody Wittenbach, uh, the executive director for the Roach Center for Catholic Education, Michael Serrazio, who's an associate professor, professor in the communication department, Peter Martin, the special assistant to the university president, Patricia Delaney, who's the senior director in university communications, and our director, Karen Kiefer, uh, the director of the 21st century. And finally, it was an honor to collaborate with such an amazing group of authors, artists, and also publishers, all of which contributed generously to the magazine's theme. Uh, too many to name here, but they're all in the magazine that's on the table that you can look at soon. And, he, and they were all very willing to support what will sure to become a long-lasting resource in support of the church and our faith. So. Now time for introductions to two specialty, specialty, two special faculty uh, members of the Boston College Theology Department who will be offering their insights on journeying in faith amid polarization. Father Ken Himes, OFM, is Professor Emeritus in the Theology Department at Boston College and is presently Franciscan Scholar in Residence at Siena College in Albany, New York. 
Father Himes received his PhD from Duke University and has a special interest in the areas of Catholic social teaching, American Catholicism and social reform movements, and fundamental moral theology. A past president of the Catholic Theological Society of America, he is currently completing a book on the theological sources for Catholic social teaching that will be published by Georgetown University Press in the fall of next year. Brian Robinette, our guest editor, is associate professor of theology at Boston College. After receiving his PhD from the University of Notre Dame in 2003, he taught at St. Louis University for nine years before moving to Boston. He researches and teaches in the area of systematic, philosophical, and spiritual theology, with special interests in theologies of creation, the doctrine of God, and contemplative practice. His first book, Grammars of Resurrection, A Christian Theology of Presence and Absence, published by Crossroad in 2009, received awards from the Catholic Press Association and the College Theology Society. His second book, The Difference Nothing Makes, Creation, Christ, Contemplation, was published this spring by the University of Notre Dame Press. Please join me in welcoming Father Ken Himes and Brian Robinette. Thank you, Lynn. And uh, thank you, Karen, both for those um, very warm introductions. And of course, in addition to repeating the thank yous for all of those who have been involved with this, Megan Hopkins, who was unable to uh, join us here, a doctoral student here. It was really that team, I kind of think of it as the dream team, that made this possible. Though I have the honor of being the guest editor of this particular magazine, the the bulk of the work and the creativity and the details really go to those people who have already spoken here. So I, if you would, please with me, thank you to Lynn and Karen for their work with this. And of course, I wanna thank uh, Father Kin for, for coming here. I was just telling him a few moments ago that the first time I don't think we actually had a conversation, but the first time that I had the opportunity to hear him in person was when I was a master's student at, uh, in uh, St. John's University in Collegeville, Minnesota, uh, back in 1998 or 99. And I remember that talk very vividly, and I have been a deep admirer of Father Ken, and his role in the department and at BC has been really extraordinary, and it's amazing that you would come back uh, for this event, and it's probably also an indication that you can't get away from the clutches of Boston College for too long. We want, we'll keep bringing them back in, so thank you for being here. I thought I would just spend a, a few moments indicating something about the origins of this issue, some of the conversations, some of the ideas that were being generated that brought this into, into being, and, uh, and then very briefly lay out the, the contents. And then I'm gonna draw Father Ken into uh, conversation, and his article is really one of the pillars of this issue. And we asked him if he would consider writing it, and he immediately responded yes, and I think it is a, it is a, a, a beautiful set piece that really <clears throat> establishes the tone of the, of the magazine overall, so I'm gonna ask him some questions, and then he and I are going to engage in some dialogue about this before then we kick open uh, conversation to you among people at the table with the question that is sitting at your table now, the big question. So that's sort of the itinerary of things to, to come, but a little bit about the origin of this. It was been about a year and a half ago, I would say, uh, Father Ken and I and Karen and some others are part of the steering committee for the church in the, 20, in the 21st century. And we had been kicking around some ideas for programming for C21, possibly also some ideas for future issues of the Resources magazine. And we, we kicked around a number of ideas, but at one point, very crucial point, Father Ken had... Um, indicated an interest at least in bringing to our, our conversation on the steering committee the problem of polarization. And it just so happened that he had been doing some more academic research on the subject matter, which would ultimately culminate 
in a journal article, but he brought his research to bear and just kind of gave us a, a snapshot of uh, what it is that he had learned and some things that we might consider. I was very eager with this as well as the rest of us. I'd been thinking about the problem of polarization for some time and it happens to be related to some work that I've been doing for a long period of time in terms of why do human beings engage in conflict, how do they get polarized, and how does the Christian tradition offer resources for diagnosing that but also leading out of that into reconciliation and creative belonging with one another. And it was at that moment when I began to offer some of these comments, just enthusiastic response to Father Ken, uh, Father Leahy, in his very characteristic way, said, well, looks like we may have a guest editor for the next issue. Well, I, of course, I knew what that, that meant, and uh, we knew that Father Ken was going to be retiring, and, um, and so uh, I was kind of the, the one in the room to do it. But I gladly embraced that, and we began some brainstorming in that steering committee, and be really launched a, a collaborative effort which would involve people with, C with C21, but also extending to others, and basically asking what are the things that would seem essential for a one-stop shop for readers who could get some sense for the dynamics of polarization. We hear this term a lot. What does it mean? And how did we get so polarized? Can we provide some you know, handy information, some insight into the process that has led us to a place of being so deeply conflicted with one another in this country, in the church, maybe also in our various institutions, including the university. But it's more than just diagnosis, it's more than just description. The real key was, what are the resources from our faith, the Catholic faith, from Catholic social teaching, Catholic practice, Catholic intellectual tradition, Catholic spirituality. What are the deep resources of our faith that we can bring to bear upon these dynamics that we share with other people who, of course, may not be Catholic? And then finally, the idea with a with magazine, in, in, a, in addition to this deep dive into Catholic resources, was to find ways to offer concrete takeaways for readers. You know, some very concrete practices or principles that you can keep in mind, of course, drawing from Catholic social teaching. We have um, pieces from the bishops' conference. We have, bishops, we have pieces from students. We have pieces from, from uh, administrators, from theologians, a whole range of, of people who are involved. But takeaways that can really equip people like you and me who are dealing with the dynamics of polarization in a million and one ways in our lives and in our work. How is it that we can be sources or models of creative integration, working through conflict towards some kind of solidarity with one another? So that was, that's essentially the, the magazine that you have in, in your hands. It's really what it was meant to do. And as I mentioned, we have the one set piece by Father Ken, uh, really designed to, to uh, give an anchor to, to, the, to the magazine. And then we've collected from a, a variety of resources takes on this very theme. So with that said, and maybe some other things can come out of that, particulars of the of the, um, of the magazine, I'd like to in, um, invite Father Ken to some conversation and have some, uh, a couple of questions for him just to kind of get going, really directed around the article that, that he wrote. Um, and then th some of the questions will kind of radiate in some dialogue as we make our transition to some discussion among yourselves at, at the table. So, Father Ken, again, thank you for, for being here. And as I mentioned, it's an honor to, to sit with you and how much I've learned from you. Um, I would like just to ask, um, really, maybe if you could briefly say something about some of the research that you were doing and, and uh, what you learned about what polarization is, what are some of the peculiar dynamics of what we call polarization, and maybe, maybe some sense of why you think we are in the problem that we're in. Why are we so polarized, if you would? Thank you, Brian. Uh, 
In the introduction, the one crucial piece of information you did not get about me is that uh, I'm from Brooklyn, New York. So this is, the accent you're hearing is the way God wanted English to be spoken, and uh, <laughs> you get that as a bonus. Uh, and again, I want to thank the people who invited me, Karen and yourself and others and Lynn. Uh, and the magazine really is, I think, the issue is terrific. And as Brian said, there's a lot of practical how-to things in the, in the issue. It's not all theoretical. I think mine's one of the more theoretical pieces. But uh, what led to this in my own mind was I was doing, as Brian mentioned, research for a, a much longer article uh, that was basically trying to do a kind of theological reflection on the 2020 uh, election year and looking at the literature that came out during that time and trying to say, well, what, what does a person of faith have to say about the issues that came up during the election? But what became much more uh, vivid for me was just the tone and the tenor of public discussion uh, prior to the election. And it struck me that there was just an awful lot of sort of free-floating anger out there in our society. You see it in all kinds of ways. But th there's so many people who are just, you know, one insult away or one person cutting them off on the highway or uh, one uh, sort of dirty look from someone across an aisle. They're that close to just snapping and going off. And it, it really began to strike me this is a serious problem in our society today. We can't function as a democracy, which requires at least some modicum of civic and civil life, if we're all ready to just jump down each other's throats at a moment's notice. So I started reading a lot of the social science literature in this. And one of the things that came up was this term polarization again and again and again. But what really kind of caught my attention was there was one article written by a whole team of social scientists from about 15 different major universities. There was about 20 authors in the article published in a political science journal. And they said the real term should be political sectarianism rather than political polarization. And they said it because they said polarization doesn't get at the moral dimension behind the controversies. And their point was that Sectarianism comes out of the world of religion, right? That groups that break off from a majority church become a sect. And uh, oftentimes they're people who are trying to lead a reform and see themselves as they have the insight that the larger church is forgotten. And uh, what these people were saying was that mentality is important to understand our country because a great many people in our society today are absolutely convinced of their moral righteousness and the moral lack that they see in the wider society. It's a very judgmental posture that people assume. And I, I thought that was both a very telling and insightful way of phrasing it. And then I thought to myself, well, what, what do we as Christians, Catholic Christians, do we have anything to say to that sort of political sectarianism, that kind of deep moral divide that separates people and allows people to really think of themselves as we're among the saved and the rest of them are damned. Right? And, uh, and so it was in reflecting on that that I thought this is something that C21 could, could take up and address because it, unless people like ourselves who care not only about our little corner of the world, but we care about the wider church and the wider society and the wider world, unless people like us are willing to try and think these things through and talk with each other and try and advance some ideas as to how to proceed, then I don't know how you keep uh, the vitality and the life of a democracy going. So that that sets up very nicely the, uh, a follow-up question that I have with you and just a, a, a little bit of commentary on that as well, that you say that this language that some um, social analysts are using is drawn from religion, political sectarianism. 
Um, that does invite us to consider, well, the, the, some of the religious dimensions of, uh, of this. One of the things that you, you point out in the, in the piece is that there may be something to do with the decline of religious belonging that has had something to do with um, grasping, people grasping at political partisanship as almost like a substitute, as though belonging to this particular party or this particular cause would give me a sense of um, belonging to a group larger than myself, but almost functioning kind of as maybe a religion. Will you say a little bit about that in terms of some of the receding or the declining role of, of religious belonging as maybe a part of the, of the diagnosis here? Sure, Brian. Uh, yeah, I, I, this again is a phrase that I, I for the larger article I took uh, from the social scientist, and it was a, uh, uh, I forget the professor's name, she was the professor, she was the uh, president of the American Sociological Association a number of years ago, and this was her presidential address that she gave, and she did it probably about 10 years ago. It wasn't related to the election per se. But what she talked about was the decline of what she called cross-cutting loyalties. And what she meant by that was that, and, and this has been cited since then by many, many other social scientists and sort of supporting that, perhaps the best known person that some of you may be aware of, Robert Putnam, who's a professor over at Harvard, wrote that well-known book, Bowling Alone, about the decline of community in America. And the religion issue was of a piece with that. It's, and her point was that many people grew up in this society in the past, and they belonged to multiple organizations. You had your family, of course. You had your church. Maybe you belonged to a bowling league, or the YMCA, or you were part of a library book club, or uh, you, were, you were part of a union at your workplace. Uh, you, uh, you coached kids in Little League or things like this, but that many people had sort of loyalties to a variety of groups. And the point being that, you know, you may think your, uh, you know, your political views are so much wiser than some person you're working with at the factory, but at the same time, we're both in the same union and you saw some commonality with one another. And I couldn't just dismiss my coworker as a fool or an idiot. I'd say, I really disagree with him on that, but, but he's a good guy. You know, I've worked with him, he's a hard worker, he's a decent fellow. Or in a parish, especially in some of our larger urban parishes, they were real mixing bowls, right? You could be sitting in a pew, and at one end of the pew might be a family of five, uh, living a fairly strong middle class, upper middle class life. And at the other end of the pew could be a, an elderly widow on a fixed income. Uh, you could find yourself sitting next to someone of a very different ethnicity or, or racial background. Classes were mixed in these things. And the point being that if I was loyal to whatever parish, I couldn't just dismiss the people who were praying with me on Sunday. And so the point being that what cross-cutting loyalties mean is we all had multiple groups to which we felt some loyalty, some fidelity, and those groups all asked different things of us and allowed us to see the complexity of issues and the differences among people, and yet they're good people. I don't have to judge their character. I don't have to belittle them or demean them, you know, because even though I may disagree on X with them, I share Y with them. And, and what that got me to thinking in terms of our own uh, contribution here was with the decline of these cross-cutting loyalties, increasingly people are defining themselves simply by the smaller, more enclosed groups that they're part of. And so now I maybe only have one or two cross-cutting loyalties. And, uh, and it got me to thinking about, as you know well, Brian, uh, one of the crucial issues for anyone to decide as you get older in life and mature, but it's especially true for people of faith, is to ask the question, who am I? Who am I really? What's my identity? Who do I want to be? What do I want to become? What sort of person do I want to be? And 
you know, as we all know, famously, uh, we think about adolescence as the crisis of identity. Eric Erickson told us that adolescence is essentially a crisis where young people are trying to figure out who am I. I'm no longer daddy's little girl, right? I'm no longer dad's, you know, little pal. Uh, I'm no longer simply uh, my, a classmate of somebody, or I'm no longer simply friends with this person. You start moving into a wider world, and all of a sudden, there's a whole lot of different hats you can put on. And that much of what you're doing in adolescence, and I would say even here at BC for a lot of our undergrads, they're constantly trying on different hats to figure out which one fits, which one is the real me, so that who I am on campus is who I am with my parents, right? There's usually a big divide right now on that, right? Uh, who I am with my friends is who I am with, you know, people I work with. Uh, to try to integrate that sense that I'm not just this person who's one person with this group and another person with that group and a different person with that group, but there's an integrated identity that what you see here is what you're gonna get in other settings. I know who I am. And it seemed to me that one of the great contributions of religious faith is it has often in the past supplied for people their primary identity. Whatever else I was in my life, I knew I was Catholic, right? I knew I was a Christian. And so what I tried to do was look back at how has religion done that, and that led me to a reflection really on the deep polarization that existed 2,000 years ago in the community in Corinth in Greece, and how St. Paul tried to address what he saw as the polarization taking place among Christians in Corinth back in those days. Yeah, uh, let's, let's continue with that a little bit, kind of making this <clears throat> some inroads into drawing upon our faith, um, the deepest resources of our faith, one of them, of course, being s scripture, for <clears throat> providing us some insights and practical guidance in, in working through this. So you mentioned St. Paul, and the little piece that I wrote, I just make the, the, the point that, um, of course, political sectarianism may have some new features to it in our time. The problem of human conflict is hardly new. And it turns out that whatever else we wanna make of the scriptural traditions where we see rivalry among brothers and tribes and nations, and, and of course in the New Testament we have at the very center of that uh, a crucifixion of a of a man who was, let's say, somewhat controversial. You know, it wasn't just because he was an easygoing guy that he was regarded as a blasphemer and an enemy of the state. So conflict and its resolution seems really important to our scriptural traditions. And of course, when we think about what it means to be Catholic, being on the whole or a sense of wholeness or some kind of unity in, in, in the midst of difference, that this is, like I say, core to what it means to be Christian and Catholic. So in, in light of that, in light of our scriptural traditions, or if you want to think about uh, moving in terms of other aspects of our Catholic faith, where do you see one or two of the most important contributions that our faith really makes to us when we think about not just human conflict in, in the broadest uh, terms possible, but specifically in our time when we feel so polarized. What are some lessons you think, a couple of them, that you'd like for us to really think about? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's a tough question, of course, Brian, but uh, two things come to mind. Uh, and. Uh, one of them I mentioned in the article, uh, the other one comes up in some of the other pieces, yours and others, that are there. Uh, how, how does Paul deal with things in Corinth? Mem remember the conflict. The conflict was Paul is there in Corinth, he's with the Corinthians for a number of months, and then he goes off and starts another church in Asia Minor. He leaves the Corinthian community to continue his apostolic work. And he hears rumors about these deep divisions in Corinth. And the divisions arise because there are different factions within the community, some of whom say, I liked Paul, 
I like Paul's preaching. I like what Paul was teaching. Then there was another famous uh, disciple of the Lord who we don't hear much about except in the letters of, uh, of Paul, but was a man named Apollos. And there are others are saying, oh no, I like Apollos. I think Apollos has a much better view of Christianity than Paul. I, I'm going with Apollos. And somebody else is saying, I like Peter. I like what Peter has said, what Peter believes. And Paul it writes this letter to them. And at one point he basically says to them, are you out of your minds? Have you lost sight? Did, did Peter die for you? Right? Did, were you baptized in the name of Paul? Right? Were your sins forgiven in the name of Apollos? There is one Lord, and you are all loyal to that Lord. Apollos, Peter, Paul, all we did was try to proclaim the message of the one. Don't lose sight of the one who is the source of who you are and your identity. And then he goes on, if distressing to them that this is the heart of the matter, that you don't lose sight of what you are primarily, is you are a disciple of the Lord Jesus, not Paul or Apollos or Peter. Know who you are. It's the identity question. But then he goes on to say, but let's face it, there is diversity, right? Corinth was a very busy seaport town, ancient Corinth. And like any seaport town, there's a lot of coming and going. There's a lot of trade going on. There are people passing through on their way from one region of, the, uh, of Asia to another part of Asia Minor. And so there was a great deal of diversity in ancient Corinth. And Paul doesn't deny that or paper over it or say, well, that doesn't really count. He acknowledges that. But then the image he uses, and it's one that's familiar to us all, we've heard it so many times, but it was somewhat novel when Paul uses it. Paul comes up with this image of, you are all part of the body of Christ. But the body has different limbs, has different organs. They're all different parts of the body. The ear is not the same as the foot, right? The mouth is not the same as the eye. The leg is not the same as the arm. There's legitimate diversity. But none of the organs or the limbs understand themselves as not united in the body. They are nothing if they're not part of the body. And his emphasis is on, yes, accept diversity. Right? It can be a good thing. It can enrich the body. The body needs all the different organs, all the different limbs, the different senses. So none of these things are unimportant, but none of them are the body, right? And don't lose sight of that primary identity. And so for him, that was the real task, was to bring these people back to not denying their diversity, but putting it in the context of know who you are primarily, right? The social scientists call it mega identity the identity that sort of subsumes all the other identities. I think the better t the term I prefer is your primary identity, right? We all have multiple identities, but what's the primary identity? What really gives you direction and guidance in your life knowing who you are? And for Paul, it's the body of Christ. And for me, I think if we simply recognize that and realize first and foremost, I'm a Christian, way before I'm a Republican or a Democrat, a free marketeer, a social welfare thinker, straight or trans or gay. All these other identities may be legitimate, fine, good. I should not define myself primarily in those other ways. That first and foremost, I am a Christian. That gives you the orientation then, it seems to me, in the context within which to deal with diversity. And then the second point I would simply raise is fundamental to Catholic social thought is that there is a basic fundamental dignity to all persons simply by virtue of the fact that in Genesis we are told all men and women are created in the image of God. You don't get your dignity because society confers it on you. You don't get your dignity from your bank account or your IRA. You don't get your dignity from the title you have on a campus. You don't get your dignity from somebody conferring it on you. Every one of us has a basic dignity that is given to us by God. So that 
when we enter into that community, the body of Christ with others, we recognize, yeah, the arm and the leg are not the same. They both have dignity. And I don't have to be engaged in, yeah, well, some of us are more dignified than others. Or some of us, we're all together, but we all know who's really in and who's not, you know? And so it's, I think, a break on the judgmentalism and the moralization of so much of our society. We were constantly trying to figure out who's us and who's them. And almost invariably, the them wind up being evaluated as less than us. You know, that's, that's really important because one might imagine that to the extent that Christians understand that their primary identity is in Christ, uh, that that would seem to come at the cost of relatedness to others, but it's exactly the opposite. It's actually because of that primary identity that allows one to have a sense of rootedness to be able to be open to others who may not share our views or who may not have our background experience. That there's a kind of confidence, not necessarily rooted in total certainty in my opinions or my convictions, but a deep confidence knowing where my dignity and my true identity comes from so that I may venture out, be more free, actually enter into some uncomfortable places to welcome or to engage others who are very different from me. Those cannot be opposed to one another. It's both and. Now, I know that we're going to be wanting to make a transition here to um, the big question on the table. And uh, as we we do, I think Lynn is going to introduce this, kind of address this, and then as we return, I think the idea is some of the things that are raised up in your discussions at your table. Uh, Father Ken and I will be here to engage in any conversation that comes up subsequently, including some concrete things, other concrete things related to the magazine's contents. So. Thank you, Brian. Yes, that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to give you about 10 minutes to talk to each other. And we've put this big question on the table. So we'd like you to think about what is one thing you could do in or for your own world with your family, your friends, your colleagues, your community to lessen polarization. So if you can just have 10 minutes together talking and then we're gonna bring everybody back together um, and share and also give you an opportunity to ask Father Ken and Brian questions. Thanks. Hi there, Um, I'm Tom Plant. I'm a visiting professor from Santa Clara University, a sister school of Boston College. Love it here at Boston College, although the weather was better at Santa Clara. Um, First off, thank you for a wonderful presentation and a wonderful issue. Lynn gave me a copy of the issue the other day and it's just outstanding. I hope it gets wide readership uh, to people that are not just the choir, but but everybody. Um, We we had a very engaged conversation and um, uh, Connor here, uh, a finance major, was talking about connections with um, others by finding commonality, even when you think that you don't uh, uh, have commonality. Can you find commonality? Um, uh, And then we also had a conversation about a conflict on the golf course about politics uh, and uh, trying how people are very quick to be anti-intellectual and allergic uh, um, to uh, that their allegiances uh, cause uh, people to blind themselves to the input of others. And then finally, um, I'd like to say, uh, 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 I heard a wonderful talk on this topic, answering this question by a, a Jesuit at Santa Clara, uh, Father Mark Revisa, who's a philosophy professor, who offered, um, I think, a very helpful uh, way of thinking about this using three, appro- three approaches as we uh, uh, talk with people. First, approaching people with accommodation. Can you get into their brain, into their skin, hear their story? You don't have to agree, you don't have to like, but can you get in and understand accommodation? Two, approach with humility. Can we approach with humility? And three, because of uh, what Father Hines had said about um, our identity as Christians and the dignity of all people, can you expect goodness to come from others uh, given that we all have the divine spark? So accommodation, humility, and the expectation of goodness goes a long way because you can't demonize 
others if you see the sacred, the divine, and Jesus in, in everyone. Thank you. And I experienced much of what you said. There was a, a Jewish friend of mine, Daniel Epstein, who traveled the world to interview people about faith, and he had three faith questions. He didn't go into why they believe as much as wh where does their faith come from. And then we did a sacred listening session in Charleston, South Carolina, and uh, trying to bring the community together. So with Hindus and Muslims and Christians and Jewish, um, all different denominations. And basically, he played a little bit of the videos of the interviews of people who were both either atheist or uh, believed in, in things that we weren't even familiar with. And then we sat across from others who we had no idea what their faith was, and we asked them those three questions, only listening, not answering, not responding, just very focused listening. So the sacred listening sessions um, it sounds that that's what happened. We had the accommodation, we had to approach it with humility, and we expected goodness because of the way he set, he set it up for us. So um, thank you all so much again for your presentations. Yeah, thank you both uh, very much for your comments and for uh, the magazine. Um, as I thought about this question, um, one of the, a line in the magazine that really stuck out to me when I read it was in Maureen Day's article um, when she says, polarization is a matter of two opposing rather than different ideas organizing the whole of an existence. And thinking about that as a working definition of polarization, which resonates with me, um, I think immediately to kind of a dynamic of polarization in our current society being the ways that sort of the nature of truth in itself in a lot of ways is under assault. Um, if you can look at, like to pick up on the example of the 2020 election, I think like looking at what happened after it, of did some, like who won that election? And like if that is a dynamic of polarization that would seem to me as operating under opposing rather than different ideas organizing the whole of an existence, like how I don't really know what the question is that's coming out of it, but I struggle with that in relation to a question of like something I can do in my own world to lessen polarization. Not that I think there's not anything I can do, but I guess I, yeah, I'm struggling through that. Now, this may be indigenous to my generation, although I put the question to my young friends here at our table, and they all send a smile in recognition. But for some reason, as Brian and, and Ken were speaking, I couldn't stop thinking about Thanksgiving dinner. It's the most polarized time and place in my life. And I terror, I, I, I worry about it, because every year, because how do you approach, because we have a great day, we have about 12, 15 people who meet consistently uh, each, each year. I kind of hope and pray some of them don't come, but they typically do come. <laughs> and, uh, and we go around then to give uh, thanksgiving for our blessings, and invariably somebody will thank God for, for Donald Trump or for God knows what, and then we're off into, we could be into a fist fight. So next <laughs> Thanksgiving, I'm going to ask them this question. How many of you can imagine ways to contribute to, to decrease polarization in our world? How many of you can bring help with reconciliation and bringing people together? And it just might be a more pleasant Thanksgiving dinner. Yeah, thank you so much for the talk. It's been fantastic. And just on that one question that came to mind at our table and that I've been thinking about is, what advice do you have for us given that Obviously, our, we could use our faith to lessen the polarization, but in many ways in today's day, given the polarization, our faith can, uh, expressing it can actually be seen as taboo and can actually be a polarizing aspect itself. You know, I, I see in, um, now in higher education while I'm going through it, you know, people will ask, oh, or they'll see my chain or they'll see other things that indicate, oh, are you religious? 
and you never really know what, what answer to give them. So I guess my question is, what advice do you have for us when our faith itself can be the polarizing aspect? Uh, how, do, how do we navigate that? Might take an initial um, lurch at that question. The, the um, context I think of immediately in light of that question is, is uh, the classroom. That wouldn't be everybody's experience here being a teacher in a classroom, but I think it would have some analogies. And, and that is being able to model a, a, a way of holding multiple perspectives at once without being, uh, feeling the need to make immediate judgment about them. So, you know, I may, if I'm, a, if I'm a Catholic theologian in a classroom where we're discussing big questions ranging from whether God exists or not to what does it mean to be human to what's the good life, I need to not assume that I can't ask that question or facilitate the conversation as though I need to pretend that I don't have a Catholic faith. But I can learn certain kinds of skills of dialogue to be able to see perspectives and to hold them in some kind of creative tension for one, with one another, and maybe even give a, a, some sense of how I understand what are the values that are being upheld in each of those positions. Now, it happens to be that my commitment to my faith is part of what is... Um, and giving me enthusiasm to do that, giving me courage to do that. But I can be present in my faith without having to declare it and modeling a way of holding various positions and seeing what kind of values they may have and then offering at a, an appropriate time where it is that I'm coming from, what my convictions are. I think that when people feel that their values have been, whether, they're, whether the values are explicit to them or not, they can kind of lie in the background. If they feel that their values have been heard in some way, that they've been recognized in how they feel, um, then that can open them up to other people who may have different positions than themselves. So you, you know, as a, as a person of faith, yes, by declaring or being obvious that you are a person of faith may have a, a, produce a certain reaction in some. I think how you embody that faith by a deep kind of um, openness and an appreciation for the value of, other, of the other can allow them to see what might be redeemable or virtuous about your own faith. I, along the same lines, Joe, I, I think uh, we have to recognize that uh, there are many people who have been hurt by religion. Uh, there are people who have been violated by religion. And so I think to realize that to simply respond, are you a religious person? You don't know if you're affirming people or they're going to see you in a judgmental way. And so my take would be to be akin to Brian's, it would be to speak fairly broadly and just say, I am religious in the sense of I believe in a God and I believe in a God who, who has created out of love and that there's a purpose and plan to my existence. And then a person says, well, what does that mean? Then you can, you know, you can go and take it in different directions. But I think the point would not, I would not start off with, oh, yes, I am. And by the way, I'm a Catholic priest and I'm a Franciscan. And, uh, you know, that may want them to stay at least 10 yards away from me, you know. So I think, I think the thing is approach people at a human level and, and talk with people in terms of the reason I'm religious is it helps me appreciate my humanity and your humanity. I have a question for Brian. Uh, I haven't read your piece yet, but I'm really struck by the headline meeting polarization with loving solidarity. I mean, solidarity does seem to be at the heart of what we're talking about. But I wonder, and maybe you address this in your piece, what about the way in which solidarity can become blinding within the tribe to the extent, whether on the golf course, in my experience yesterday, or in the church or in politics, how do we 
engender a solidarity that um, moves beyond the tribe somehow. I think you, and, and I would pick up some of the language that you've used. Any term can um, be different in its meaning depending on how it's used in its context. In some cases, the word solidarity, many cases maybe it seems something very positive, but solidarity is a term that may seem more like closed in on itself. But towards the tail end of what it was that you were saying, solidarity that isn't so uh, contractive, but is actually open. That would be the the move that I would I would like to make with that. I think that if you know, loving solidarity does not mean the coalescing of identity. If identity is achieved by some definitional contrast with the other, that I think is the key. If your sense of solidarity is premised upon we're not like them, that's not us then it has this kind of uh, contrastive and somewhat combative um, foundation, and it's very tenuous. Mm -hmm. But if a, a sense of identity or solidarity, yeah, a richness within uh, a sense of we and our group and maybe distinctive, if it has a natural openness to being inclusive, to being welcoming, to being um, you know, open to being challenged, um, having its own um, inwardness being challenged by perspectives that it wouldn't be able to generate by itself, then I think that that's the key, sort of some of the criteria for what would be healthy solidarity versus unhealthy solidarity. Thank you. Um, I'm going to use a combination of words that was used by, I'm assuming your pronouns are gentlemen, he, him, his. Okay, I like the word that he shows solidarity and also, I'm assuming you, he, um, I, and because I'm, I'm not part of the choir, right? I, I am, consider myself Catholic. In, in fact, Chris Posh took me to St. Francis and I was there during the Padua thing where there was a lot of racist things happening in Padua at Siena College. I did not know that you were gonna be a speaker, so this is not a setup. Um, but I, I think that it's not being judgmental, right? I think it's holding accountability to core religious values that we are all the children of God. However, most of the world, how it was built, how it is now, Catholicism has a lot to do with it, of how it is, and I think trying to say we're all children of God now invalidates everything that has happened or is, or is a accumulation of what it is now. And it's, some of us are coming into spaces such as this one with PTSD and other things where we feel like even though leaders of the church say we're all children of God, we have not all been treated like the children of God, whether it's done through war or omission of things that are happening, we don't feel that space, right? And then you add a layer of where we are in, in America, where it says the Constitution, we, we the people are find ourselves to be equal, Come on. right? So we're coming in, into these spaces with, with different perspectives. So one thing that I wish that I could provide, you know, as an answer to your question is a brave space for accountability and to define certain terms where I'm not being judgmental, I'm not being, um, does anyone here speak Spanish? Como se dice peleonero? Combative. That I'm not being combative, but you know, because of my faith, I, I want people, like, I, do you, did you happen to know Father Chris Posh? I think he was the epitome of what a Franciscan is, right? I, I did a year of FEN down in Wilmington, and I, I think we can all get there, but we have to acknowledge how we got there, and the church needs to take accountability of its omission and activism in where we are now. No, I, I absolutely agree with you. Chris, and Chris was a fabulous guy. Uh, died way too young. but. Uh, yeah, I think, I think in some ways it goes back to the question to, to, to Brian and Brian's response. The uh, 
Pope Francis likes to use this language of culture. He talks about a culture of engagement or a culture of this or a culture of that. And uh, two of the things he plays off at times is he talks about a culture of inclusion and a culture of marginalization, right? And what he means by culture, I think, trying to interpret Francis, he's not always consistent in the way he uses terms, but he, uh, I think he's talking about how do you create an environment uh, that becomes, you might say, the, the, the tone, the tenor, it sets, a, 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 it sets expectations of how we approach one another in a given culture. And his point is that what we should always be striving for is a culture of inclusion. You keep bringing more and more people in as opposed to a culture of marginalization. You keep pushing more and more people out. And I think you're absolutely right. The church can very, uh, I think, his be shown historically to have played as much of a marginalization role in history as an inclusive role in history. And what Brian is talking about in answer to your question, I think, was this whole point about solidarity. If it's a solidarity that effectively marginalizes people in order to achieve solidarity within a smaller group, that's not the kind of solidarity that's a Christian virtue. And the solidarity that keeps trying to reach out and become more inclusive and keeps asking, who, who is out there on the margins of my awareness? You know, who, who are the people that I have given no thought to today at all? You know, what groups do I rarely think about or reflect upon or whose experience doesn't count for me? And when you start to think about life that way, then you realize how, how very effective we are at marginalizing people. And that the challenge then becomes, how do I keep bringing more and more people on the margins into the center of my attention. And I think that's what Francis means by a culture of inclusion. And I think it's only a culture of inclusion that really makes for a legitimate virtue with solidarity. Well, unfortunately, it's time to end this program. Um, it's right at 1.15. We thank you so much for coming. Um, I hope you'll follow along via our website and social media and learn more about our events um, as we journey this fall, um, including dialogue workshops. And Tom Groom, you'll be very happy because we're actually doing a special event before Thanksgiving to help you at the table. Um, that said, you'll notice on our tables that there are Expresso Your Faith Week booklets. They're hot off the press. There's over 50 faith-filled events. Please grab those. And then also, um, there's a Faith Feeds Guide. We have a Faith feed series where we take pieces of the magazine and um, use them as a catalyst for conversation. If you liked this lunch, you are invited to another Faith Feeds lunch a week from Monday during Expresso Your Faith Week. It's called... Um, lessons in friendship amid polarization. So um, you're welcome to um, RSVP to that. And again, thank you so much for your time. Spread the word, spread the magazine, continue the conversations. We're all together. Thank you. <laughs>